completely, like I said, completely normal life. I got to high school and I was a skinny kid. I uh, just got my braces off. My, you know, my body didn't match my face, I felt like, and all, all this like insecurities and stuff. And looking back, I had really low self esteem. I just wasn't like, couldn't handle being in that situation. But I could, as long as I was high. You know, and like, when you have low self esteem, Low self-esteem always like gravitates towards drugs. And so it was in my first day of high school, everyone came back to the school with red eyes. We had an open campus for lunch, which meant that you could come and go as you pleased. And I see my buddy Lewis, he was there. People were handing him money. They were getting in their cars and they were coming back with red eyes. And the next day, you know, that day I asked them and said they were going to smoke. We were smoking weed, I went and smoked weed, and every day after that I smoked weed. You know, I found what I was looking for. I liked the way weed made me feel, I liked to be stoned, I liked to not really care. And it just kind of put me in another realm, another place. I, I felt accepted, now I hung out with the potheads, now I was a pothead. The thing with me was I always took things to an extreme. You know, still to this day, I buy a pair of sneakers, I start collecting sneakers, I own, you know, hundreds of pairs of sneakers. I started smoking weed, Smoked weed every day. Uh, being a young entrepreneur, I immediately started selling weed. And, you know, that gave me like a feeling of power and things like that. It was like, you know, one day, first day I ever tried it, three days later I'm selling it. It just didn't really make any sense. <laughs> you know, and um, the problem with that was like, you know, I could buy sneakers until the end of the time and it would never keep my mother up at night. It would never make her cry. It would never make me homeless. Uh, the thing with drugs was is that marijuana, very quickly for a guy like me, was not enough. You know, uh, when I got introduced to that crowd of people, I got introduced to another world, you know. It was no longer the baseball team or the basketball team, or the soccer team. It was now, you know, the kids that were doing drugs. And so immediately we started, I started seeing things like Vicodin and Xanax. And keep in mind, this time in like 2005, 2006, Heroin wasn't as mainstream as it is now. If you said the word heroin, people looked at you like you had nine heads. But it was around. You know, it just started to come. This is when Oxycontin was uh, very popular. They were still writing prescriptions for it left and right. And, but the first drug that I really, truly fell in love with was cocaine. I love to use cocaine. I love the way it made me feel. Um, I had no off switch for cocaine. People snore cocaine, they drink a couple beers, they hang out. I would buy a bag of cocaine, I would not come out of the bathroom unless I was getting more cocaine. And I would take every dollar I had and buy cocaine and I would sell everything I had and I would not be able to stop until the drug dealer shut off his phone. And that was when I was at a young age. You know, as I got older and I started to like live homelessly in ghettos around New York City, um, you know, there, I found drug dealers that were 24 seven. And that was, a, that was a real nightmare for me. But it was what I wanted, it was what I searched for, it was, you know, and I got what I wanted. You know, I wanted to be high. I went to my first treatment center when I was uh, in between my junior year and my senior year of high school. I like 12 days in treatment, they told me a couple things to do when I left. They said get a sponsor, go to some meetings, continue with therapy, change your friends. Um, find a hobby, focus on school. Believe it or not, my grades didn't really, uh, getting high didn't really affect my grades too much. But anyway, those suggestions, that all those suggestions they gave me, I, I checked out some meetings. You know, I got a sponsor in title. You know, but I never like invested anything into recovery. Not like halfway invested, in, halfway as much invested as I was into getting high. Like I was all in on getting high. You know, like I said, I started smoking weed, then I was selling weed, I started, you know, seeing cocaine around, then I was sniffing cocaine, I was Xanax, all that stuff. I was invested in that. Like, I put my all into that. And so shortly after, you know, I started using again. You know, life was still going on, time doesn't stop when you're getting high and you're struggling with addiction. You know, I graduated high school. I didn't go to any of the school events or any of that stuff, like the prom, or, you know. That wasn't my thing. You know, I, I like to get high. That was, that was what I like to do. And that's what I did. You know, I got into college. I went to this maritime college in New York. And um, 
I thought that that would change change me, fix me. My parents was hope or hope or hopeful that that would. That didn't change me either. Um, you know, I eventually stopped going to there. I was experienced, you know, being homeless for the first time around 18 years old. My parents had enough. They told me get out. You know, come back when you got a come back when you got a year clean. You know, a year a year clean is uh, is a miracle when you suffer from addiction. I could never get there. You know, I was numerous times I put together eight nine months. I would go to treatment. I would go to a halfway house. You know sleeping on a bunk bed somewhere, put together a little bit of time, and like right at the point where I was about to turn my life around, I always had this uncanny ability to just tear it down. Like time after time, I could like tear life down, my life down real quick. Like in a weekend, in an, in an afternoon, in an evening sometimes, I just destroy everything. So like, you know, when you do drugs and you're homeless or you know, you're estranged from your family, you know, there's consequences to that stuff. So I, I got arrested a couple times in uh, South Jamaica, Queens once. In like a week one time, I got arrested like three times. I remember the narcotics officer was like, didn't we just catch you like last week? And I was like, uh, no, nah, it wasn't me. I'm trying to like, bullshit him. But, um, so I got put into like a thing called treatment court. So they would monitor me. They would take my saliva, they would take my urine, I would go to the intensive outpatients, and still, still trying to manipulate and figure out ways to get high. It's like 72 hours from the last cocaine and heroin use, and I would know that I would be clean. So like I would try, like uh, if I was getting tested on uh, Monday, I would try to stop getting high on like, Friday. And uh, I was, you know, doing fairly well with it for like a couple of weeks, something like that. And then, uh, then they got me. I, they caught me in court, and they, they remanded me to court. I made my first uh, my first trip to Rikers Island. I'm a few years older than you guys, you know. It's a jail in New York City for those of you that don't know. It's um, it's a lot like the Plaza Hotel. No, I'm just kidding. It's a, it's a lot like hell. It's um, it's absolutely terrible. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, not only because I was in jail. But by this time, I was also an IV heroin addict. So I was withdrawing in jail, uh, which meant that I was sick, like flu-like symptoms and times a million. And uh, that was not fun. And I left there, I got mandated to a, a, it's called a therapeutic community. It's a TC. It's a behavioral modification type of treatment center. It's not one where you come in and they say, okay, you know, these are the steps and this is your therapist. It was one like where, they would like have you like go sweep the sunshine off the parking lot, kind of thing. Like you know, give you a teaspoon and tell you to go shovel the snow. It was like, and it was designed to break you and build you back up. You know, it's kind of hard to break someone that's already broken. You know, I was already broken, so I went through that. You know, I was real good at like treatment. I would do real well in treatment. Addiction responds well to treatment, in my opinion. You know. I would feel better, I would get better, I would look better, things would start to come back into my life, I would send out a couple job applications, I would land some job that I really didn't deserve. And then eventually I would, you know, fall back into drugs. Time after time after time after time. Um, you know, I thought for a very long time that um, nothing was my fault, that I had just bad luck. You guys ever think about that? You know, you get caught doing something, it's like, I just got caught. I'm doing the same thing that he's doing. This kid definitely relates. I like you, bro. I can relate to you. Yeah, I always thought that like, I just had bad luck. Like, if I just wouldn't have been on Suffolk Boulevard, I wouldn't have seen those narcotics officers. If I would have just waited five more minutes at Booby's house, then I'd be on the train. I'd be on the train right now getting high. Booby was my dope dealer for like eight years. Forgot to mention that. Yeah, Booby's probably like a millionaire today because of me. But yeah, Booby was my dope dealer. And uh, yeah, I know it's funny. He's actually in prison now for the rest of his life. But it's funny. Anyway, um, Booby probably killed also like 25 of my friends with his heroin. So um, yeah, I don't like Booby too much. But anyway, um, 
you know, that's the reality of it. I mean, we can sit around, we can laugh and things like that, but the fact of the matter is, is that drugs are killing people. Young kids, just like you guys. You know, a lot of my friends are dead. A lot of them. And being in so many treatment centers and meeting so many addicts and people that suffer from this disease, I've met thousands of people, you know, and I see a lot of them now. I you know they don't live in my area. I don't see them face to face anymore. But like once a week or twice a week, I'll see on Facebook, like, oh my God, I can't believe you're gone. And it'll be like another one that has died, you know, and that's the path that I was headed. The, um, there was a point in my life, you know, my last treatment center, which I'll get to in a little bit, that I just realized, and I tell it to everybody that I work with today that's, that's using drugs, especially a drug like heroin, or crystal meth, or crack, you know, like those hardcore drugs that like, you know, you're living on borrowed time. You know, and I was living on borrowed time, a lot of it. You know, and I don't know how I got so lucky or so blessed, but you know, fortunately for me, I made it out. You know, um, there was a really lot of bad experiences that occurred in the midst of my drug use. Um, some of them I'll get into, some of them we won't have time for. But anyway, this is me as a heroin addict on the left. That's me uh, modern day today. So I weighed like 130 pounds. Um, I couldn't afford a haircut because I spent all my money on drugs. And uh, that was a real low point in my life. That was taken out of detox. I snapped it up myself right before I went in. That was my fifth time at the detox in like two months. And uh, <clears throat> I had figured out that like for insurance purposes, like you could go to detox like every other week. And that was all I could make it at that time. I couldn't last more than two weeks in society before I would need to be detoxed or I would die. My body would actually start to shut down. I mean, I was blowing through bags of heroin like it was nothing. I was a bottomless pit of drugs. And uh, if I wouldn't check in the detox, I knew that I wouldn't make it. And I never, you know, I didn't want to die at that point. You know, so I would go in, but I also didn't want to get better. I had become what they call comfortable in the misery of, uh, of drug addiction. This next photo was actually taken, I don't know, like a month or so after, after that one on the left. Um, so when you're using drugs, you actually kind of start to run out of resources after a while, you know? And you run out of scams and you just stop really caring. You know, you just, at a certain point, I just really stopped caring, you know? So I got into this, got this little hobby going of robbing drug dealers. And that picture on the left, on the right there, uh, on the left, I'm obviously very strung out on drugs. And on the right is after I robbed uh, some drug dealers in an area of Miami called Overtown, Miami. And um, they caught up with me a couple weeks later and they stabbed me. They tried to kill me. And um, I don't know. I don't know how I lived through that one. But I do know that it took me like nine days to go to a hospital with a gaping hole on the back of my neck. And I got very badly infected. And so you have to put yourself in the perspective of what kind of mind frame you're in to actually get stabbed and then wait nine days to go to the hospital. You know, it's not like I got a mosquito bite. I mean, I got stabbed. And, um, you know, pretty smart guy. You know, did really well in school. Didn't think that when I first started smoking weed or drinking some beers with my friends that my life would ever turn out like this. But it did. And at the point when I realized that I wanted out of this life, it was not nearly as easy to get out of this as it was to get into it. I mean, it was hard. It was hard work. It took me 29 treatment centers to find my way. And so when I wanted to find my way, I realized that all the stuff that I did during my addiction really didn't, really didn't matter. You know, um, I write about it quite often. People really enjoy the writing and things like that. But as far as like me figuring out, let me explain, okay? I believe that everybody that uses drugs deep down really doesn't like themselves. 
and everybody has a reason why they get into drugs. Who in here has a family member, themselves, a loved one, or knows someone that's addicted to drugs? So we got everybody in the room has their hands raised, right? So are those people weak people? I mean, what, what is it about those people? Are they dumb? Anybody, you can shout out an answer. What do you think? No? You said no, okay. What do you think, why do you think they do? Well, yeah, she said because it feels good. I mean, you know, there's no doubt about that. Drugs feel good. That's what they're designed to do. But what makes them pick it up to begin with? That's the answer that we're looking for. Because they're sad. Could you be more specific about that? Right. So they have something about their life that they don't like. All right, so there's some people, for instance, like, uh, there's some people that have things go wrong in their lives and they'll talk to their friends about it, they'll go to their pastor, their priest, their rabbi, they'll start getting involved in exercising. And those are what I like to call, see, I think there's two type of people in the world. There's the addicts, and then there's the people that aren't. And so the regular everyday people will cope with that normally. And then there's, there's the addicts that will use drugs because they don't want to feel. Like incapable of dealing with everyday life. See, I could do some things that you guys would be scared to death of, and you guys do things on a daily basis that when I was your age used to scare the life out of me. Like coming to school, talking to people, saying how you feel. That stuff scared me, but I could walk into the crack house. No problem. I could rob a drug dealer, no problem. I could go into an area that I know is smothered with undercover police officers and I could buy drugs. That wasn't a problem for me. And so I found out that all addicts really suffer from one thing unanimously, and that's low self-esteem. And it didn't matter that people told me, hey, Kevin, you're intelligent, Kevin, you're funny, you're good looking. It mattered the way that I thought about myself. And so right now is probably one of the most impactful times of your self, you know, years of building self-esteem is the fact that you guys have a lot going on at a young age and you're all about to embark on the next part of your life as far as um, college, you know, careers, whatever it is that you do in your life. And I can tell you this, whether you realize it now or not, the people that you see around you will not be there, your friends and things like that. You're pretty much be on your own. Uh, Miss Lewis won't be there to coddle you and, and you know hug you in the hallways. It's a very cold world out there, as you see by the uh, the scar on my neck. You know, and um, I wasn't ready for it. Definitely wasn't ready for it. I was I was ill prepared, as they say, for what was to come for me, and I couldn't even see it coming. You know, and I thought that me and my friends were just going to keep getting high, and you know. Stuff would work out, and it, it did, you know. So, <clears throat> at 27 years old, I found myself homeless in the South Bronx, addicted to heroin and cocaine. Um, South Bronx is a, it's a pretty rough neighborhood. I didn't really like it too much. You guys would. It's uh, nothing. Nothing good goes on there. And um, someone called me. My friend Lewis called me, said, I'm coming to get you. <clears throat> and I was always like really bad at taking other people's advice. I couldn't listen to anyone. I was a know-it-all, I knew better, you know, and um, it was, that was the thing about addiction that was so frustrating to me is I had never failed at anything in my life until I started trying to get clean. That I just couldn't do. And that was because I couldn't get out of my own way. You know, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. You know, and I couldn't take other people's advice. And Lewis said, hey, I'm coming to get you. I said, okay. Like two days later, he said, this is where you're going to treatment. I said, okay. I was in treatment and the therapist started telling me things to do. And I just started like doing exactly what they said. Because I was so sick and tired of being that guy up there on the left. 
I couldn't take one more second in that misery of that. You know, I couldn't take one more Christmas alone in a train station. I couldn't take one more phone call from my mother crying. I couldn't take being fired one more time for nodding out. I couldn't deal with any of it. And I really didn't have like high expectations when I went to treatment, as I said. I, you know, I just thought, okay, you know, I'll go there, I'll do the, the you know, I'll fatten up, I'll do the oil change, and we'll see what happens. And I started working. I started working very hard. And next thing I knew, it was like I became on fire for recovery. Just like when I first did drugs, they, they helped me, they felt good, they, they, they killed the pain that uh, she mentioned. I didn't have to deal with that stuff anymore. That's how recovery worked. I know that a lot of you guys have, uh, this is a very hard hit area by the drug epidemic. And I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. It's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. There is really not a lot of resources in this area. There's really not much. Um, this right now is probably the most valuable thing that you guys could do for yourselves because Nobody was coming into my school and doing this stuff. And I know some of you are looking at me like, I got eight heads. Like, how did this kid not get it? Like, you don't do heroin. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how I didn't get it either, looking back. But, like, drug prevention is extremely important. Because there's a lot of you that, whether you realize it or not, are actually going down the wrong path. People used to say that to me, and I'd laugh at them. I'm like, what are you talking about? I got straight A's. And it really didn't hit me until I, I got a job at this company one time and I finished the, uh, the training period. I remember the vice president of the company, she called me and she was like this older black woman and she must have known what I was doing. And uh, she said to me, she said, Kevin, I wanna tell you something. I said, okay, what's up? She said, you will either be the CEO of this company one day or you'll be doing life in prison. And that's two completely contrasting uh, options there, right? And I was looking at her and I was like, what the hell? You know, how did she know? And she knew that I was a junkie. She knew that I was doing drugs. She also saw the good in me. You know, and um, how many of you guys, what do you guys think of drug addicts? You think that, uh, you know, they're like scum or? You can tell, like I, people, listen, I, I read a lot of stuff on the internet. It goes, it gets like a ton of attention. There's plenty of people that write on there, like a loser, you know, Junkie, uh, it doesn't bother me. It's, uh, I'm just trying to help you guys with the stigma. What do you guys think of people that suffer from addiction? Do you think that there's something wrong with them? Huh? Yeah, you think they have a story? Okay. What do you mean by that? Okay, I'm trying to, you know, I, I'm from New York, you're from North Carolina, so I'm trying to understand the accent a little bit. I also can hear that. Well, you're saying that they have stuff hidden, right? The story? Pain? What, like, I, what I was hearing her say is that people have a story afterwards that they can share. She compared it to like you oh, yeah. sharing your story. They definitely do. You know, if they can make it out. And I think that they, they play the statistics down. I know a lot of really young people that have gotten clean. A lot of young people that have gotten clean before me, a lot of people that I consider role models and very successful people in life and recovery in all areas of, of everything, but I think that, yeah, they do have a story. But I also think that there's a big stigma attached to drug addiction, and I think that the general public really thinks like lowly of us. They think that there is, um, that we make a choice, like that we choose to be like this, you know, and. Um, some of the other students keep asking me to read the stuff that I write. So um, I'm gonna pop one in here. because This is like the sixth time that I've done this story today. Anyway, so there's a stigma attached to drug addiction. They thought for a really long time that it only happened to people in the ghetto, that you had to be raised a certain way for, you know, to get affected by it and that, you know, you were just like weak people. And then when like a lot of like really young people like yourselves from all over the country started dying, people really started looking at it. You know, so I think that for everything there's a reason behind it. This is something that I wrote. This one, 
This one did really well. This one got like 8 million shares on Instagram, Facebook. Um, and so I said, you see heroin and I see low self-esteem. You see cocaine and I see fear. You see alcohol, I see social anxiety. You see track marks, I see depression. You see a junkie, I see someone's son. You see a prostitute, I see someone's daughter caught in addiction. You see self-centeredness, I see the disease. You see a pillhead, I see the overprescribing of opiates. You see someone unwilling to change, I see someone hasn't connected with them yet. You see denial, I see someone hurting. You see someone nodding out, I see God showing us they need help. You see the end, I see the beginning. You see a dope fiend, I see a future success story. You see them, I see me. And that is something that I believe that's the way we need to look at people that suffer from addiction, especially if you have kids in your class, people that you love, is that they're sick people. They're not bad people, they're sick people. And that anybody, especially if a guy like me, could get clean and get invited to Lenore, North Carolina, coming from Long Island, New York, to come speak in your high school, on September 7th, then there must be a little bit of hope out there for people like me. Because personally, I was kicked out of my high school. It was not allowed there. They said, we're gonna send the teachers to your house because we don't want you in the school. So life has kind of come full circle for me to come around and speak in high schools. It's, uh, it's a pretty big change for me. And um, I did that. I've learned how to do that in one way. I learned how to love myself. And that's what I figured out. Is that anybody that's using drugs, using al abusing alcohol, hurting themselves from the prostitute you see on the corner looking for her next fix, to the guy that you catch not out of traffic light, is somebody that just deep down does not love themselves. And that was the whole key to my thing. You guys look very tired, um, probably because it's after lunch. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you.